morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the societies for giving me the privilege of the podium today. So I don't have anything to disclose. So I divided this talk into two components. I'm going to start off by talking about some evidence behind laparoscopy for colorectal emergencies, and then I'm going to go on talking about some tips and tricks that we can all use in the operating room if we're considering this approach. So for laparoscopy, we know that greater than a third of the acute surgical admissions are for colorectal pathology. And when we're thinking about the cases that we want to take to the operating room, we're really thinking about the patients that either are bleeding, perforated, or obstructed, or a mix of all of these. But less than 10% of these cases are taken to the operating room and undergo laparoscopy. And really, there's a paucity of robust data out there looking at the benefit for laparoscopy and colorectal surgery. So here's a study looking at, I'm going to go over some of that data with you. Here's a study looking at uh, emergency laparoscopic colectomy and how does it measure up to open. And this was done in 80% in of the cases, the cases were emergent, so the, the surgeon would assess the patient and the patient would be in the operating room within uh, a few hours for the following pathologies that you see here on the table. And when they compared laparoscopy to open, they found that the laparoscopic uh, patients who underwent laparoscopy had significantly less blood loss, uh, quicker return to flatus, quicker return to diet, early hospital discharge, and when they looked at complications and mortality, there were no significant differences between them. And just of note also, uh, in this study, the surgeons were two experienced laparoscopists. So they concluded that with increasing experience, that it is a feasible option for the reasons I mentioned. Here's a NISQIP study comparing laparoscopic surgery to open in the emergency setting. And they only looked to make the population of patients as homogeneous as possible. They only looked at patients who underwent colectomy with an anastomosis. And here are the operative indications. So um, what they found is that in the laparoscopy group, patients who had either malignant or benign neoplasms as well as diverticulitis tended to, uh, the surgeons tended to favor laparoscopy as an approach, whereas those who had uh, vascular insufficiency tended towards more of an open approach. But overall, um, what they found is an increase in operating time, which is a recurring theme that we see in all of these studies, and a shorter post-operative and total length of stay. And again, the morbidity and the mortality, there was no significant difference between both. So these authors excuse me, basically concluded that although laparoscopy was performed in a small number of patients, they had favorable comorbidity post-operatively, and uh, their length of stay was shortened. So this is an interesting study looking at conversion in laparoscopy as a whole. And when they compared it to open in a significant amount of patients, over 200,000 in the national inpatient sample with a conversion rate of 16.6%, you can see that emergency surgery wasn't the highest risk factor for converting to open. It was more for Crohn's disease, patients who had had previous abdominal surgery um, or undergoing proctectomy had higher odds of converting to an open procedure. And also what you see is that those that were converted to an open procedure actually did better than those that were started off as an open case from the get-go. I'm going to go over a few systematic reviews. Uh, this was one looking at, does laparoscopy have any benefits in the emergency setting? Small number of studies, only 22, 22 of them in over 5,000 patients. Again, this theme of, re of longer OR time and shorter length of stay um, and a conversion rate of 3%. And you can see that the reasons for converting are quite understandable. These are patients that either had dense adhesions, uh, gross bowel distension, fecal peritonitis. These are not the cases where you want to keep on pushing yourself laparoscopically. It's safer for the patient to convert to open. But they, dis they, they concluded that where it's technically feasible, there's better short-term outcomes than the open resection. But obviously, with any type of uh, research in the emergency setting, when we look at laparoscopy as a whole in the emergency situation, the evidence, there's mostly non-randomized controlled trials, they're mostly case series, case reports, and you're dealing with a heterogeneous uh, patient population group. So sometimes it's difficult to draw conclusions from this. But they do show that it is feasible, even though there's this bias in selecting patients for which uh, surgical approach you would prefer, and just the inherent difficulties with dealing with research in the emergency setting. This is a systematic review that Dr. Spain touched on earlier that uh, also um, came up with similar conclusions. You're dealing with heterogeneous studies and the literature is divided, but again, when you look at all the studies put together in the laparoscopic group, there's this trend towards shorter hospital stay, um, fewer complications, and longer OR time. But they do say that 
in those cases, it's safe for both malign and benign and malignant diseases. And if there's one thing to take home from this study uh, is really to think of these three factors. You have to think of the patient selection, which is key. Some patients will just tell you, you know, based on their clinical situation that they cannot undergo a laparoscopic procedure because they're unstable and they're not fit for laparoscopy. So always think of the patient. See if the surgeon is adequately experienced and feels comfortable with the approach. And obviously resources are really important because if you're gonna take someone in the middle of the night with a team who's on call, who has, doesn't, who's not really familiar with the laparoscopic equipment, it's probably not the best time to, to pursue a laparoscopic approach. So resources are very important. This is another systematic review here, again, uh, concluding that it's feasible as long as the, train, as, as the surgeon is adequately trained. And you need to think of your own personal experience, the clinical situation, and the working environment. And um, obviously, early conversion where technical problems are anticipated, but this is a pretty good quote. Laparoscopy must not be used as an alternative to good clinical judgment. So I'm gonna go over a few colorectal emergencies with you. I can't touch on all of them, it's a pretty big topic, but um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because uh, Dr. Spain went over this very nicely. The great debate really lies for laparoscopic perineal lavage for drainage and purulent uh, diverticulitis. And we have two recent meta-analyses that are analyzing those three randomized control trials that were mentioned. And I'm just gonna summarize them very quickly for you. I know we touched on this already. So we have the three trials, the ladies trial, the Scandiv trial, and the Delala trial. And comparing three randomized control trials is not a significant amount of trials, but um, you'll see here that, just to keep of note, in these two, tr in these two trials, uh, the patients went to the operating room, they put in a scope, and those that had purulent peritonitis were then randomized in the operating room. So that's how they basically um, randomized their patients, whereas the Scandiv trial, they went according to CT findings of free air and clinical peritonitis. And these patients um, in this trial had anywhere uh, Hinchy grading anywhere between grade one and grade three. And of note also in the ladies trial in the Lola arm, so there are two arms, the DIVA arm is actually still ongoing and it's comparing Hartman's procedure to, to uh, colectomy primary anastomosis, plus or minus stoma. But the Lola trial was terminated early because of high unplanned surgical reinterventions in this group. But as a whole, if we put these two meta-analyses side by side, they come up with similar conclusions with a uh, higher reoperation rate at the index admission higher intra-abdominal abscesses, but in the long term, at the 12-month mark, there were less reoperations in the patients who did well in the laparoscopic lavage group, less wound infections, and equal mortality. So they said it's advisable to perform laparoscopic lavage if it's technically feasible, because the whole idea behind starting all of this is patients who just have um, purulent peritonitis, likely by the time, you know, the reason they don't have fecal peritonitis is because maybe the perforation sealed off and you'll get away with doing, uh, similar to a percutaneous drainage that we do for abscesses, a washout and a drain in the operating room. There's um, uh, another trial that we're waiting for the results, the Lapland trial, so we'll see what, what comes out of this one. This again, uh, looking at inflammatory bowel diseases as a whole uh, in the emergency setting. I'm gonna summarize this very busy table for you, but the trend is towards shorter hospital stay, increased OR time, but earlier PO intake and uh, equal be or sometimes better uh, morbidity than open surgery. So a few other colorectal pathologies. If we look at the management of large bowel obstruction, this is a prospective study looking at 24 patients, a single surgeon, um, patients who had large bowel obstruction. And interestingly enough, they created an operative space in order to visualize and be able to operate by decompressing the bowel with a 19 gauge uh, syringe. Here's their data. So they only had two conversions, one readmission, two takebacks, um, and six complications. But they concluded that it's feasible and safe with a low complication rate and early hospital discharge. So this is relaparoscopy for the management of cases that you've done laparoscopically in the elective setting. And then, unfortunately, they have a complication. What do you do? So these are 79 cases that they took back. Um, and performed laparoscopy in the emergency setting, 94% success rate with only 6% conversion rate for the following diagnoses here that you see on the table. And they said that it's a safe and effective tool and it should be the first step for re-exploration, assuming that the patient is stable enough to tolerate the laparoscopic approach, but convert uh, to an open procedure if needed. And lastly, this is uh, patients who come in for colonoscopy and unfortunately have a perforation. These are healthy patients their bowel is prepped, uh, what do you do? Go to the operating room, do you do laparoscopy or open? This is a single surgeon 
Uh, this is a single study looking at um, primary repair. Obviously a shorter incision length, I would hope so. <laughs> Uh, that was significant, but less complications and a shorter length of stay. So, uh, to finish off, if you're thinking about a laparoscopic approach, you're assessing a patient in the emergency room, what do you do? Patient selection is key. Uh, we all know those who are going to tolerate laparoscopy and those who will not. Uh, but think about the patient first and really communicate with your operative staff. Who are you going to be working with? Who's going to be helping you out? Try to mark the patient preoperatively if you're considering a stoma because this is going to really help you and the patient out in the post-operative setting with regards to pouching and a whole bunch of complications. Uh, typical perioperative uh, preparation, and it's, you know, to have a flexible sigmoidoscopy or a rigid sig in the room is important if you want to look at the viability of the rectum, look at the anastomosis. Um, so those are tools that you want to have definitely around you in the operating room. With regards to positioning, you want the patient to be uh, in the modified lithotomy position, low on the table. This gives you access to the rectum. Sometimes you think things are going on on the right side, you put the scope in and everything is pretty much distal and you want to get an idea of what's going on in the rectum and the sigmoid. Um, tuck the arms, you can easily just untuck them if ever you have to convert to open and put in a book walter, so that's pretty quick. And uh, secure the patient to the table because you don't know what positions they're going to be in to get good exposure. And with regards to strategy, so think to yourself, is there any distended bowel, does the patient have any map on their belly that's previous scars that are kind of making you think of how bad it's going to look once you go inside. Communicate any issues you have with your anesthesia team. So you can just, you know, typically just put in a guided trocar in, through the umbilicus or in the left upper quadrant. Um, and then depending on which quadrants you're working in, kind of putting your standard triangulated ports in these positions helps, gives you access to any quadrant in the belly, and then add whatever you need to get good exposure because that's really the key. Use a wound protector if you want to exteriorize the bowel, whether you're dealing with um, an abscess or a malignant tumor that's perforated, you want to protect the wound and leave drains uh, when appropriate. So in conclusion, uh, as I mentioned, so the liter literature in the emergency setting for laparoscopy is overall descriptive, but you have to really think if there's one take home message from this talk is think about the patient, um, the surgeon, your own experience, and the resources that are available to you if you're considering this approach. And diagnostic laparoscopy is a good start. And the key here, I think, is if the patient is well enough, as I mentioned, to tolerate laparoscopy, and this is a case that you would consider doing laparoscopically in the elective setting, you know, put in a scope and see how far you can go from there. But just trust your gut and do what you're comfortable with and what's safe for the patient and convert whenever needed. Thank you very much.